um, Catholic social thought is sometimes described as a hidden treasure of the church. Very few Catholics could offer a rough definition of subsidiarity. And we have to thank Father Langan for his eloquent articulation of solidarity that we just heard, uh, subsidiarity, which we just heard. Um, of course, it's unsurprising altogether that Protestants uh, don't know this tradition. Now, so I wanted to state this up front because part of what I want to do is to show the vigor, the ongoing vigor of Catholic social thought um, and as well to offer some criticisms of the document. Now, I, I won't get through all of this, but, uh, but that's, that's the general architecture of the argument. <clears throat> now what Catholic social thought offers, and I'm, I'll just say uh, CST, all right, um, instead of Catholic social thought. Um, what CST offers is a coherent worldview that differs from the totalizing ideologies of the fascist or communist sort. This brings us to the first substratum, if you will, of Catholic social thought, namely its anthropology. If your standard of comparison is, for example, uh, the contemporary academy and the logics that dominate so many of the disciplines, it is jarring to hear Catholic social thought spoken of as uh, the truth of the human subject, a truth that can never in principle be negated because it flows from or is itself foundational to the truth pro proclaimed. John 23 dips into a deep well of teaching and learning. Catholic social thought is not a theory in the sense of an all-encompassing model, but rather a kind of practical reason, the sort of reason on which politics depends. Now, the anthropology <clears throat> that's embedded and openly articulated holds that human beings have a dignity that cannot be effaced, uh, whether it's an um, uh, emaciated teenager killing himself piece by piece uh, as he smokes crack cocaine, or it's, um, it's the um, ill-smelling homeless woman uh, parked in her place on the sidewalk of one of our cities, and so on. That is, you, you, either, you either accept the dignity of the human person, or you do not. And undeniably, the two examples I gave are not attractive ones. And we tend to turn our backs and to move away when we encounter people of that sort. Um, but a Catholic social thought urges us to recognize the dignity of all without exception. And this, this includes as well uh, the persons with severe uh, handicaps. All right. What we tend to do when we confront uh, people in various stages um, of, uh, of, of illness, let's say, um, we'd rather not think about it. Uh, we, know, we know they're out there, but we'd rather not think about it. So we trot, trot out all the truisms uh, about uh, we need a war against poverty, we need a war against this, and now it's a war against mental illness um, in light of the horrible shoot school massacre. Um, and I dare say that every one of us in this room would be found to suffer from uh, some sort of complex or deviation from a norm, mm -hmm. um, given the expansion, of it, the bloated expansion of these categories of what counts um, as wellness or illness. Now the various social science disciplines in the main 
when queried, claimed that no anthropology need be made explicit by them so that the reader or student would have some sense of what holds these theories together. And many, of course, proclaim the end of, uh, of human nature. That is, we can't make any argument based on that because that is simply a flimsy construction um, and in no way meets the vigor required to do scholarship. So practitioners in the academic study of the whole range of human possibility would tell you if you did put the anthropological question that human beings are maximizers of utility. That's the dominant argument in uh, epistemology in the social sciences today. Maximizers of utility. Every human action or reaction can be cast in this language. The language again of utility and instrumentalism. Now what does this have to do with CST? Uh, because CST speaks to deeper realities about the person, it clashes, necessarily so, with all reductionist anthropologies. And I think it's fair to say that the uh, approach that I criticized, um, utility maximization, is a, uh, an impoverished view, a reductionistic view of human beings and what makes them tick. Now what turns on this anthropological argument? There's an order of nature, uh, natural law written on men's hearts um, that is necessary as the backdrop to the practical judgments made in Catholic social thought. And the order of nature, uh, our actions must conform to the order of nature according to uh, the document. We are not governed by vague, uh, vague universal laws, but by the concrete cry of conscience and a, and a common good. For Catholic social thought, human beings are bearers of truth with intelligence and free will, the underpinning of which is, of course, the creator. So we discuss and articulate rights as law. We don't invent rights de novo. The upshot, Catholic social thought shares with liberalism a certain, a certain language, uh, the language of and devotion to rights, for example. But a chasm opens up on the issue of justification. Does human rights and its sustenance and its robustness, does it turn on uh, God as its progenitor, so to speak, or does it have some independent uh, reality, independent origin? Is something else, um, not God, uh, there are some folks Call, that I call strong sovereignists argue that, in fact, political power and political structures uh, emerge from the human will. So the will triumphs in many of the accounts that CST counters. Um, It's really will all the way down. The ruler's will, the general will. Uh, this means, of course, that rights can be declared and they can be revoked. Now, if, if rights emerge through human will and human willing, and you get a different crowd in 
running things, they can simply will in another direction and revoke, as I said, or declare new rights um, in a manner that's arbitrary rather than governed by reason. In Catholic social thought, then, rights have a life and a reality of their own. They are not to be gobbled up and absorbed into some other category, as you heard in the previous uh, paper that point was made. Now, every basic human right, uh, and this is uh, from John the 23rd, um, bears its authority and the force of its authority through the natural law. Before a society can be considered well-ordered, creative, and just, and consonant with human dignity, it must be based on truth. That's the argument of Potamenteras. Much of the attention devoted to the document was focused on the Pope's ad admonitions about a just global order, a just global order. Indeed, the attainment of a common good, I'm quoting now, the attainment of a common good is the sole reason for the existence of civil authority. It's the end of the quote. Arriving at that common good requires that individuals and subsidiary groups uh, be uh, protected by law. All of, I, rereading this document, it, was, it, was, it struck me not only the optimism, but um, the, there was a kind of general trust about the world and the way the world works and uh, the, the, the very possibility um, of uh, international cooperation um, and so forth. And for those of us who um, from time to time teach international relations, um, you, you feel as if you're in an alternative universe. But it's very difficult for those who adhere to the general documents that govern their uh, subfield of the discipline of political science. Um, there are certain assumptions that are not exa examined. They're simply there. Um, some of these have to do with sovereignty, uh, the assumption that states are always in a war with one another, in situ at least, uh, and so on. So to read a document of, uh, uh, to read an encyclical focused on those issues um, and to see that it is more rigorously argued uh, than the texts that we're looking at in political science uh, is, is, is instructive um, because you do have this rich sort of articulation of uh, what the common good requires. It doesn't mean, doesn't mean you think we can get there, but what the common good requires, um, where the human person sits, if you will. Um, what about institutions below the state? Well, we've got subsidiarity to think that one through. Um, so it's, as I said, CST is uh, encompassing without being um, totalizing. Encompassing without being totalizing. Now, one feature of, to stay on the theme of the self, and we're still there. One feature of celebrations of and arguments for self-sovereignty is a very strange abstractedness. And there's those who oppose CST uh, 
presumably oppose or differ with uh, the anthropological assumptions, among other things. And they preach and embrace a notion of self-sovereignty, um, ignoring that human beings are earthy and earthbound creatures. And we can soar, you know, we can be sort of positioned into place uh, and move about, as the theory suggests, only in an abstract and disembodied way. And Charles Taylor calls this modern excarnation, modern excarnation, that invites a hyper-exaggerated notion of what can be achieved through various philosophical modalities. We create systems, we live in our heads, we expect selves and society to conform, and then we, we shall have established sovereign control. But if we lose, I want to suggest our embodied relational selves, which should make us, all of us, less all-knowing, less harsh, we lose dialogue, that dialogic self uh, that John talked about. We lose a sense of what is appropriate to and achievable by creatures such as ourselves. And we also lose history, living incarnational realities of human life in common. As Emeritus Pope Benedict, is that the way I'm supposed to re refer to him? Uh, Emeritus Pope Benedict uh, argues, without embodied history, political theory becomes an entirely Gnostic enterprise. All words, no flesh. All spirit, no body. Now the 20th century mind was susceptible to seduction by socio-political doctrines that abstractly dealt out death. I mean, that was the end point. That was the telos driving uh, these, these thinkers uh, who helped to articulate uh, the norms of the force of uh, the philosophical justification of totalitarian ideologies. The 21st century has already treated us to some examples of the same sort of thing. And then, again, there is a flattened out one-dimensional view of human beings that this totalizing ideology uh, feeds on and promotes and, and uh, articulates in a way that it, it, it simply becomes a kind of mantra rather than an argument. There's a wonderful poem, of course I'm going to forget the title of it, uh, by Cheshla Miłosz. Um, in which he indicts the vulgarized knowledge that voices birth to the feeling that everything is controllable. For example, and this is a quote from Miłosz, the young cannibals who in the name of inflexible principles butchered the population of Cambodia and who had graduated from, from the Sorbonne and were simply trying to implement the philosophical ideas they had learned. So the, these philosophical ideas articulated in CST presumably would form a human person in a way that differs quite strikingly from the way people are formed in, uh, in totalitarian systems. And that formation, that process of formation, is absolutely vital. The church doesn't hold on to and articulate um, its vision. It will, it will become desiccated, if you will. It will lose its um, reflexivity. It will lose its robustness. And that can't be allowed to happen. Now there's... Um, this is embarrassing. I'm just going to go get through one point, I think. Um, but at any rate, uh, I think I'll stop. 
uh, right here was the, the point about the self. Um, actually, no, I can't. I've got to do. I've got to do uh, at least a little bit of this. Um, there were uh, there were those in uh, Europe, Western Europe, after the war, um, who were radically disillusioned by the war experience. Um, and uh, they wound up being uh, either just s staying away from politics or occupying certain uh, radicalized positions, as they called them. Um, there were some, very few, but some who did not succumb to the totalitarian uh, charm. And one of those was uh, Albert Camus, who in his uh, great essay, The Rebel, writes, if we believe in nothing, if nothing has any meaning and we can affirm no values whatsoever, then everything is possible and nothing has an importance. There is no pro or con. The murderer is neither right nor wrong. We are free to stoke the crematory fires or to devote ourselves to the care of lepers. Since nothing is either true or false, good or bad, our guiding principle will be to demonstrate that we are the most efficient, in other words, the stronger, and that is the measure of success. Uh, and interestingly enough, what Camus calls this his overall sort of framework uh, as he analyzes this, this sort of this type of nihilism. Uh, it's all sort of nestled in under the rubric of European pride. This is a story of European pride. So he, he's able, Camus is, um, to articulate how the world has changed in profoundly uh, negative ways, but, but nonetheless we need to be hopeful, not optimistic, because that means we believe that things you know, really will go our direction, but hopeful that um, through these terrible tragedies and the responses to them, and of course uh, the encyclical is one such response, uh, we will find a way to alter the world in, uh, in a, a direction more conducive to the attainment of a common good, an international common good, if you will. Um, now, I think what I need to do with this part is just talk it through rather than to read There is a, this is a, a movement in CST from uh, self, uh, community, uh, the international level, and so on. So he says, John 23rd says, uh, we need to lay down certain principles drawn from Catholic social thought for relations between states as well. And here he pursues an analogic, ar analogic argument okay, um, that holds that uh, selves and their status as persons of irrevocable value, that is held up by states uh, that are themselves by nature, equal in dignity, he tells us, um, and they settle disputes uh, in mutual ways. This is uh, number 89. Each state is like a body. He's going back to the, you know, the medieval um, corporeal and metaphors for, for bodies politic 
All, each state is like a body, the members of which are human beings. And as we know from experience, nations can be highly sensitive in matters in any way touching their dignity and honor and with good reason. Now, we move up another level from the relationship between states no longer to be governed by, you know, suspicion and and uh, loathing and fear, uh, but by this mutual dialogic uh, approach to the issues that beset us. All right, so we've got that view of the state, and then we go to uh, the issue of. Uh, a level beyond the state. Is there one? Uh, well, clearly, John the 23rd believes there is. That there is some international common good that flows from the logic of Catholic social thought um, and helps it to uh, be the, the sort of all encompassing without being totalizing, all-encompassing view that's offered up. Um, so this is not a shy document, to say the least. Um, it, it, it is rather audacious to um, argue from, you know, the, the, the individual baby in a, in a family to some universal world order, uh, but he's got it all in there. And um, he states, this is number, paragraph number 104, something that is very interesting. Here are his words. We have here a complete reversal of the right order of society. He's examined um, some issues involving subsidiarity. For the whole raison d'etre of public authority is to safeguard the interests of the community. Right. Safeguard the, in the uh, interests of the community. And you cannot do that uh, if everything is left open to competition among free, free willers, if you will. Um, so one has to protect and recognize the realm of freedom and rights, but never do so in a way that um, overrides uh, the human person. Now, what he hopes for, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I think this is, is um, some kind of international body uh, or entity uh, that um, is recognized by states to be legitimate um, and it can be judged, uh, it can judge states, judge states who have acted in violation of human rights. Right? But there is no binding force. Where would the binding force come from? So that's that's an issue that he recognizes and has no mm -hmm. has no real answer to. Uh, I mean, who does? <laughs> you know. Um, all right. Um, let, me, let me just bring this to a conclusion. Um, as I was reading or rereading the encyclical, I thought about Chicago and uh, Jane Addams, the great social thinker and reformer um, about whom I've written uh, an intellectual biography. And it seemed to me that the argument she was making uh, bef before uh, World War I and right after the war and during the war. Um, that argument was very similar 
very similar to the one that John the Twenty Third makes uh, after a different war. Uh, we we forget if we live through it, um, and we're old enough to have memories of it. Uh, we forget that there was a kind of euphoria at the end of World War II, um, gave rise to utopian possibilities, it seemed, um, and people did soar in their expectations uh, and their articulation of what it is they wanted to see uh, come, into, come into play. Um, a terrible cataclysmic war always seems to inspire and its aftermath. Uh, you know, these, these plans for some alternative. No different, again, from World War I era to the World War II era. Um, here, if one were telling the whole story, one would have to put together uh, an argument about human rights, of course, and their enforceability or not. Um, and certainly that's something that, that can be done within Catholic social thought. Um, my voice is about to give out, so I think I'd better start, uh, or, or you know, or, or I could try to mime the argument, but I don't, I don't think that would be very elegant. Um, so uh, let me leave. Let me leave us with some questions. One of my first questions is. Where, where is sin? Where is sin in this document? It is the anthropology is so uh, hopeful, mm -hmm. so cheerful in a way. Um, the possibilities to, to understanding and justice and so on, um, you know, there's, we'll, we'll, we can get there. Um, and there's very, no talk whatsoever about um, the fall. I, I think so, I thought sometimes uh, different points that John the Twenty Third had forgotten the fall. Uh, it's 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 quite it's quite astonishing. So where is where is sin in this document? Um, the, the next question related to that one is um, what is the purpose finally of governance? Um, John 23 argues that the sole purpose, the sole reason that we have governments is to promote a common good. Promote a common good. So there one wonders where, where is um, crime? Uh, where are there, where does he locate, you know, the affronts that often trigger longer disputes? Um, we have no sense of how law is implemented and we get no sense of uh, how we are to assess what a state is up to. Uh, nothing other than uh, is it violating certain rights, and that's pretty much that's pretty much it. Uh, and the final question is um, again about this possibility of a new world order. Um, that's that's a possibility that, that dies hard. Um, how would you construct, using this document, Pacham and Terrace, how would you construct a plausible, a plausible uh, world order? You may have something that 
is quite coherent, but it's not at all plausible. And that's, that I think has been a real problem, whether we're talking about um, Catholic social teaching on these matters uh, or about Jane Addams, alas, uh, being very lonely in her advocacy, uh, arguing against uh, enlightened opinion at the time that initially was against the war and then the great progressives like Dewey moved to enthusiastic endorsement of World War I for its uh, progressive possibilities. The state could take over, state could take over more and more uh, of the uh, functions of society. Right. And we could leave behind the parochial and the petty and so on and so forth. So there's a direct violation of the notion of subsidiarity and claims of that kind. Well, all right. Um, I think I'd better stop right there. Thank you.